it's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm a big fan of the work that you're doing at Heterodox Academy. Um, so um, why, why am I here? Um, so first I wanna say, I think it's great that we're finally able to have discussions like this on the Stanford campus because I know debate was really not encouraged uh, during the pandemic. And um, I was actually just thinking this morning, the last time, I, I think the last time I was here, I was actually interviewing for um, residency and we decided that we couldn't afford living here. And, and uh, so it's, it's always important to keep in mind at institutions like this, that this, it is a very privileged um, environment. And, you know, it's so important for academic institutions when they have so much power over the rest of the world to be open to um, outside ideas and heterodox views because people, you know, have, have various viewpoints from the different backgrounds that they have and people in academic institutions might not necessarily be representative. Um, so I um, have an MD and a PhD, PhD in epidemiology and public health from the University of Copenhagen. Um, I am also a practicing physician currently um, in sports and interventional spine medicine. Uh, I did my uh, residency at UC Davis um, and was a researcher there. I graduated in 2018. I did a fellowship after that at um, a program uh, was affiliated with UCSF um, in interventional spine and sports medicine. Um, I've most recently been doing research with uh, UCSF and University of Southern Denmark. Um, and I also uh, have a little bit of an unusual background. I was a professional runner and ran in the world championships in 2013 and 2018. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I have a little bit of different view of, of health. I'll get into that. But so I have, uh, I guess now I added it up for this talk, 24 uh, scientific publications related to COVID-19. Um, and I'll be talking about the, some of the topics, they were related to trans COVID-19 transmission in schools, youth sports, COVID-19 testing and screening, um, how we study long COVID, mask effectiveness, um, and uh, post-vaccination myocarditis and risk benefit analyses of uh, the mRNA vaccines. Um, so I listed some of the scientific journals I've been published in. Um, and so just to take a step back, I wanted us to consider what science is. So Richard Feynman says, science is a culture of doubt. I like that. And science is the belief and the ignorance of experts. Um, a more uh, recent uh, f scientific philosopher, Matthias Desmet, says science comes from that little space that is created when you realize you don't know. Um, so the scientific process is the opposite of advertising. And you basically, um, you, you want to provide all the information so other people can disprove you. It's a very humble process. Um, and so you want to set out thinking that you don't have the answer and, and be disproven and sort of, it's, it's a process whereby, you know, you, you, you look to be disproven and you look to have people bring in other, other things that you hadn't thought about. Um, to get to the answer of what is true. And so we can consider whether or not our response to the COVID pandemic was actually scientific. Um, you know, was it humble and open-minded or did we have certain people from on high saying, follow the science and that's misinformation. Um, so you can think about school closures, natural immunity, vaccine mandates, lockdowns, et cetera. Um, that's a picture of me running, sorry. So, uh, so what is health? Think about what health is. Um, so uh, happiness, freedom, community, interpersonal relationships, good sleep, lack of pain, ability to exercise and move. Um, so was our response to COVID truly, did we, did, did we prioritize health um, or was it more about fear? Um, were medical problems delayed or missed? Um, did we shut down outdoor spaces, races, parks, recess, um, youth sports? Um, so I know that I was, part of the reason I was invited here is because I supposedly have heterodox views, but, 
but my views are actually were actually very orthodox um, in in Denmark, and I ended up getting a, a a lot of grief in the United States for views which were not controversial in the country that I had moved from in 2015, um, and. And so in Denmark and in the Scandinavian countries in general, they prioritized re reopening schools and youth sports, did not mass children um, under the age of uh, under the age of 12. No, they did not have vaccine mandates um, recommended. Uh, so they recently they just said in the newspaper the risk of long COVID is one in a thousand um, in one of the Danish newspapers. So a little bit different than what we're getting here in the United States. Um, this was a picture from our TV at home, actually, when the day on April 18th, 2020, when uh, Denmark reopened schools after only six weeks of school closure. So a year later, the majority of schools in uh, California were still remote or only had one or two days of uh, hybrid learning. Um, and so why, why did it take us so long in the United States to reopen schools compared to countries we generally think of as having good and reasonable public health and science-based uh, policies. So we already knew in June of 2020 that, um, that school reopening was not associated with the increased uh, community rates of COVID-19. And we were seeing very low spread from children as compared to other respiratory viruses. Um, but again, it took us a long time in California and many states to reopen the schools. Um, and the question is, is why? And so I was, an I was the medical advisor at a large diocese in Sacramento. And we actually reopened our schools full time in August of 2020. And we had a great experience that year. And, I, and, um, and it's interesting to think about the fact that um, in, in January of 2021, less than 20% of the schools in California were open despite the evidence that we had from Europe that it was safe to do so and despite what we knew about the collateral damage that was going to be coming. Um, and I was the senior author of a study published by the CDC in their journal, um, MMWR, where we found um, in, in Wood County, Wisconsin, among over 5,000 students and staff over the fall semester that there are only seven cases of the total of 191 of COVID-19 that were linked to in-school transmission. Um, and the case rates were lower in the schools in the community. But after this, um, the CDC actually ended up putting out even stricter reopening guidelines requiring six feet of distance and testing um, and, and uh, reopening metrics based on community transmission, um, despite what our study had found that was published in their own journal. And the question was why, why weren't they consulting us, uh, the, those of us who are doing the research, um, and, and it wasn't just us in Wood, from the Wood County, Wisconsin study. It was also Duke researchers wondering, you know, why, why are these, uh, why are their reopening guidelines so strict? And it turns out it, they were most likely basing their wording on requests from teachers unions. Um, so we had to release another study explaining that uh, less than 10% of our elementary students were distant six feet. Um, they weren't masking indoors at lunch. There were no new ventilation systems. Um, and at that time, I began speaking out more publicly with uh, op-eds about the um, science uh, supporting uh, children returning back to normal life in the spring of 2021. Um, and I recommended the same for our diocese. That's not our diocese, but I just wanted to point out some of the ridiculous things that we were doing to children uh, to uh, stop resp uh, viral or uh, respiratory spread. Um, and um, we, of course, didn't ever have good evidence that masking children was going to stop the transmission of COVID-19. Um, we have many randomized studies and now high-quality observational studies, some of which I've been a co-researcher on that have found the same. Um, and I wanted to point out that Norway found the same minimal transmission that we found in Wood County, Wisconsin, in a totally unmasked uh, environment uh, in their schools. 
And so this is one of the studies uh, that I uh, published actually with Vinaya Prasad. And uh, so basically looking at the 77 studies that the CDC published uh, pertain pertaining to masks from 2020, um, claiming that masks were effective at reducing spread without having the evidence um, to, to, to state as much. Um, and so we were basically inundated by propaganda from the CDC stating that masks were effective when we actually, when the highest level evidence we have doesn't find that. <clears throat> um, the CDC also rejected a reanalysis that was uh, larger and of longer duration of one of their uh, very short um, preliminary studies that found a correlation between mask requirements and uh, uh, decreased spread of COVID-19 among children. And when we expanded the length of the study and included the entire country, we, uh, uh, the CDC MMWR uh, de declined to publish it. Um, so um, this is when basically I started getting in trouble at UC Davis. Um, I was asked by senior public information officer, not to mention I was an associate researcher in my interviews. Um, I, was, uh, I was deleted from the, the department website that I was in. I was a voluntary clinical professor and, uh, and then later an associate researcher. Um, I, at the same time, I was censored off of uh, NPR, all things considered, when I said that I didn't think ma uh, children should wear masks uh, outdoors during sports. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to remind everyone here that we actually had a, a, a so we had a prohibition on outdoor youth sports one year into the pandemic in California. Um, these are the insane, unscientific things that we were doing because debate wasn't allowed. Um, more about censorship, and I bring this up because Stanford has been highly involved in their virality project in censoring scientists. I was censored multiple times on uh, X and Facebook for basically just uh, stating CDC's own data. Um, and uh, so they discussed that already. And then the real controversy began when I started publishing about evidence of post-vaccination myocarditis. And uh, this was in uh, adolescence. And um, I was the first author on this study and we found a risk of post-vaccination myocarditis after the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine of about 1 in 6,000 to 1 in 10,000 um, in adolescent males. And we found that the second dose was not justified when you do a risk-benefit analysis. Um, and that was just looking at the risk of myocarditis alone. So I was, uh, so <laughs> This, these are some of the you know ways uh, online in which uh, I was attacked. So extreme right winger, anti vaxxer recipient of dark money. Uh, no, of course, none of this was true. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, I think I'm going the wrong direction. Uh, so I was called into multiple meetings related to this study at UC Davis, um, and uh, and they. I ended up meeting with the head, the head, the chair of epidemiology, who didn't find any issues with the study, um, and it ended up going on to be peer reviewed and published. And then I um, lost my position uh, shortly thereafter. And um, they stated that the reason was because we had a slower than anticipated recruitment and the trial that we were doing of. Um, uh, uh, bone marrow aspirate concentrate for ACL tears. Um, and of course, we didn't have as many ACL tears that year because youth sports were shut down and very few people were skiing. Um, so it was not unanticipated that our recruitment had slowed down. Um, and so it wasn't just that I lost my position, but the students that I was working with also lost their research project, the participants in our study um, we'll never get the results of that study. Um, and, uh, and then I had just recently gave, given a lecture to students, uh, to the medical students at UC Davis about doing research that is meaningful to them and that they think is going to impact uh, you know, their patients and their communities. 
And then shortly thereafter, they see me losing my job after speaking up the way that I did. And so I'm not sure if that sends the right message uh, to the students. Um, so, you know, I mean, it is what it is and I'm not angry about it, but I did basically lose my position for asking the important questions and putting in the work to get the data. And what UC Davis prioritized was having the right appearances. At least that's how it seems to me. And um, so I'm still actually doing some research with UC Davis. So I guess I just want to say, you know, these things aren't the end of the world um, and people move on, but it does send a bad message um, to the younger people, to younger researchers. And um, of course, I was far from alone in um, the types of re repercussions for doing the research, asking the you know most important questions of the day. Um, and uh, you know, the question is, were people being ostracized for asking questions, um, or, or or were they protected by their institutions? And I certainly don't think they were protected. Um, and so I think, I hope in the future, this is two people at Stanford, Jay Bhattacharya and Scott Atlas, who there were cancellation campaigns against them at Stanford, um, and they were really not protected by their institution. And I hope in the future that we can have more of a, uh, an atmosphere of attacking people's ideas and debate and supporting um, the people that work for you. So I'll end with that. Thanks. <laughs>